life was so intimately entwined with the great artistic minds of her generation. What were the events that led to her untimely and tragic death on that Connecticut highway in 1962? And could they have been avoided? We'll examine the life of this mysterious figure and talk to those who knew her both the famous and the infamous. Who was Flora Van Doren? Who was this passionate unknown? Rotterdam, 1918. The First World War in Europe had come to a screeching halt, and as a result, countries like Holland and the Netherlands were experiencing their greatest economic prosperity in two centuries. In the wake of the emotional devastation caused by the war, the first secret whisperings of a new art had begun to stir. Free from the restrictions of wartime and caught up in celebrations of peace and prosperity, curators at the National Museum were now finally beginning to take notice of the post-impressionist movement. The formalist and representative paintings of Van Eyck were being taken down and replaced by the mad, stormy visions of Van Gogh and Drysdale. Caruso, Bernhardt, and Isadora Duncan toward the theaters, while surrealism and expressionism waited anxiously in the wings of a continent's collective consciousness. It was an exciting time to be Dutch. And it was in this carefree melee that the young Gretchen Witz, bon vivant, and heiress to the von Sturgeon coffee fortune, first made her entrance into society. Gretchen, a free spirit with minor artistic aspirations of her own, became a frequent visitor to one of Rotterdam's most elegant night spots, the Moisetira Petite Braun, or Little Brown Oyster. And it was here, amidst the whirlwind of cafe society, that she first met Master Sergeant Dr. Klaus von Doren, an eminent military physician from the southern provinces, with a reputation for brawling and a controversial interest in mesmerism. It was a rapid courtship, although Gretchen's parents were at first opposed to the marriage due to von Doren's lack of funds and advanced years. They were soon won over by the doctor's sophisticated manner and by the shiny metal buttons attached to his uniform. And so, on September 14, 1919, Gretchen Witz became Mrs. Master Sergeant Dr. Klaus von Doren, M.D. Under the auspices of a civil ceremony conducted by the associate rector of the Dutch Reformed Church at Rotterdam, Supported by Gretchen's parents, the newlyweds, just married, took up residence in a large and stately home just around the corner of the popular supper club in Rotterdam. By all accounts, their first months together were happy months, but soon disaster would strike. For even in the confines of the most blissful of circumstances, the ugly hand of fate sometimes deals a fly into the cogs of destiny. In early November of 1925, Klaus met and began to correspond with a mysterious figure from England named Larry Dreyfus, an Australian and a friend of the Duke of Kent. Through Dreyfus, he learned of the vast silver mines opening in San Diego and of the fast and easy money to be had there for those eager to seize opportunities when they presented themselves and who were willing to take a risk on investments that probably wouldn't pay off, a condition that came into evidence when the silver mines were found to be fraudulent. Financially ruined, Dr. Van Doren sunk into a deep depression, losing interest in his medical duties and began to decline in health. He was court-martialed by the army, persecuted by the press and his former country club cronies. His brother was killed in a canal accident, his mother disowned him, and he was sued repeatedly by members of the civil service and private citizens alike. His very name became synonymous with wretchedness and shame. Still, his health declined sometimes in gradual stages, and occasionally in spurts, but he knew he must rally his vast medical knowledge if he was to survive. 
So, day and night, in his secret laboratory, he experimented on himself with cough medicine. But nothing seemed to help. At last, the secret police seemed to breathe its secret breath against his very throat. Under the cover of darkness, they stole away to a waiting ocean liner at the public docks and sailed toward a new life, together united. Invincible and indivisible, they landed at Ellis Island in February of 1926 and were dispatched to the prosperous Dutch Pennsylvanian community of New Rotterdam. They settled into the difficult task of rebuilding their marriage and their desperate conditions. Rarely have two separate and completely opposite people overcome such personal distance and division. Gretchen found solace in the local YWCA, while Klaus took on the difficult operation of rebuilding his medical practice. Times were hard, but the resourceful Van Dorens were among friends and neighbors, who were more than happy to make up for the missing pieces of the great American puzzle. And so, on November 13, 1928, Flora and her twin brother, Fritz, were born to the now prosperous couple. Flora, the more active of the twins, was described as a precocious child, and her mother, Gretchen, encouraged her to explore artistic expression, while her father, Klaus, continued with his cough medicine experiments. It seemed that all attention was showered on the inquisitive Flora, who soon was given dance and piano lessons. Many a night, she entertained the family with her glowing charm and intoxicating effervescency, beguiling them with her girlish, innocent remarks and coil manner. Meanwhile, her brother Fritz was usually left alone because he wasn't much fun to be around and nobody seemed to like him. In 1972, Fritz remembered. <clears throat> yes, I was the black sheep. While Flora, she was the golden fleece. <clears throat> oh shit, my models. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's good. Mother and father always seemed to shower Flora with gifts and love, while me, well, the shower was either left on cold or turned off completely. And so it was. The happy Van Dorans continued their pursuit of love and family. And it was around this time that Flora first began to paint, though she was then more interested in becoming an actress. She played the lead in the school play and began to look at movie magazines and spend a lot of time alone, practicing the classics. Her behavior became more and more erratic, but the family tried to ignore it. Her mother continued to shower her with love and affection, while her father remained distant and aloof. Meanwhile, Fritz could only observe as his sister pulled one crazy stunt after another. Hey, Bill, how's it going? Uh, yes, uh, it seemed like they always just attention was always directed toward her because she did things to disrupt her family. I mean, it's just crazy because everything, ah, oh, damn, $25,000, uh, and it just seemed uh, so crazy that the attention was still shower showered on her, period. My hair's on play, okay. Uh, and, uh, then... In 1944, when Flora was only 16, she disappeared entirely for four weeks. When the Van Dorans finally tracked her down, it was discovered that she had become illegally married to a man who claimed to work for the Astronomical Institute. And the two of them had taken a room in a rundown motel on the seedy side of the street in Wahagan near Philadelphia, where Flora claimed she was determined to attend the School of Fine Arts. Her father used his police contacts to discover that the young man was in fact an escapee from a mental institute, and he promptly brought Flora back to New Rotterdam where he began proceedings to have the marriage annulled. Who could blame him? No one. Nevertheless, Flora's rescue from obscurity was to be short-lived. She continued to rebel and confuse the Van Dorans. She was found to be stealing Fritz's lunch money and was caught playing with kitchen matches. She had violent temper tantrums, wept uncontrollably. Finally, unable to control their daughter, her family finally consented to send her to the Philadelphia School of Fine Arts in Philadelphia. It was then, in her second semester, that Flora fell under the spell of a part-time drawing teacher and philologist, Professor Mark Franz. Although in his early 50s and already on faculty probation for an incident with a terrier, Franz apparently felt no qualms about becoming involved with a 19-year-old Flora, even though he was clearly mentally unstable and himself unsuccessful in finding an audience for his own work. It was through him and his nurturing that Flora first began to find her own voice. Basil Heroditus, Philadelphia School of Fine Art, remembers. Yeah, Franz, that son of a bitch. 
I don't know why we even hired the cat. He didn't know anything about art. Hell, he tried to come over one day and try to tell me how to, to, to change my tree sculptures, which I've been working on preciously for 15 years, just one of them. And he always complained about this one spot, which I just didn't understand. I love this spot. Just, just pissed me off, that little twerp. And he just, he just would fondle all the students and stuff, and I just didn't understand what the hell he even hired this dumbass for. He just said, I love this. I love this area right here. It kind of reminds me of our paper clips. And I said, well, hell, those paper clips sucked. I wish you'd just, I just couldn't stand him. I'm sorry. I, I, I just, I, and so, you know, that's it. I don't want to even talk about the son of a bitch no more. Son of a bitch, indeed. Since 1921, Franz had obsessively created and recreated the same identical image hundreds of times. A paper clip stuck to the canvas on a wad of gum. Few of his works remain today, but upon examining these three works from different years, 1921, 1931, and 1944, his obsession is clear. Frustrated by his failure to break through to a popular, or for that matter, any kind of audience at all, he had become abusive and disoriented. It was not unusual to see him walking the streets, grinding his gum, and muttering to himself. By the time he moved in with Flora, he had begun to waste most of his energy on wine and self-abuse. Former students at the Philadelphia School of Fine Arts recall Flora occasionally coming to class with a black eye or cuts and abrasions on her face and chin. Despite all this, Franz's influence on her early art was clear, as these early self-portraits reveal. Self-portrait with black eye. Self-portrait with chipped tooth and self-portrait with skin abrasions. A fellow student recalls those happy days. Yes, I knew Floral very well, very well. Uh, I first met her when we were both students at the Philadelphia School of Fine Arts. It was obvious on first sight that she had no formal training. Her work was so loose. I kept telling her, tighten up, Fauna, tighten up. I felt compelled to teach her my techniques my secrets, if you will. And after my training, uh, she was a very passionate painter, although I suspected she was deeply emotionally troubled. Then, one day, Franz telephoned Flora from a jail in nearby Catawba County, where he had been arrested on a charge of exposing himself to a horse. In tears, Flora went to her parents once more, who agreed to pay Franz's bail on the condition that she never see him again. A month later, when Franz was scheduled for arraignment in district court, he failed to appear. His landlady, Dolores Oates, claimed to have seen him the previous evening, loading paper clips onto a bicycle and then pedaling away in the direction of the North Church. His whereabouts and any further details regarding his life remain a mystery to this day. Flora never spoke his name in public again. Undaunted by her debacle with Franz, and again defying her father's better judgment, she was allowed to embark on a three-month trip to New York. Little did anyone know that she would never return to Pennsylvania and that her parents, Klaus and Gretchen, would never see their daughter alive again. She began her stay at the Excelsior Hotel and began visiting the local night spots. Her first few days, she dined at the Russian Tea Room and celebrated in the Spanish Coffee House and bothered the waitresses at the Italian Ice Kitchen while continuing to frequent, in the meantime, the German Cola Dispensary and then usually winding up around midnight at the Franco-Prussian Juice Bar on 95th Street, near the old Hungarian neighborhoods. At first, she gloried in her newfound freedom, but as three months came to an end, Flora wired her father, asking for more money, claiming to have lost her return train pass. But at the last moment, until the very hour of the journey, she suddenly changed her mind and remained in her hotel room, incurring further charges that she could not pay, and then wandering the streets and renting a small room over the top of a hi-fi shop. She survived on cheese and a watery green soup that she liked, and an occasional whole pie, just as a treat, and sometimes a cookie and some juice that she got when she gave blood during the day. At night, she haunted the halls of the Metropolitan Museum of Modern Art, hungry and slobbering over the luscious reds and drippy blues of Matisse, and spending hours before the warmly appetizing Picasso portraits, and licking her chapped jaws over the tastefully prepared menu of the pointillists. Frustrated, unable to find her true voice, she attempted paintings in all their styles, but turned away, confused and ashamed. Then her life was changed forever, in but a blink of an eye, and still guided by the machinations of cruel fate, the tables were turned. While attending a major retrospective of shallow folk art, Flora was introduced to the controversial and confrontational Anne Clark 
who was to become her next teacher in the wayward world of upwardly mobile, bored, and self-destructive academics trapped in a maze of suburban sin and self-delusion. Clark was a former mover and shaker at the prestigious Rhode Island School of Designs, where she first began to weave her rapidly coming untied web upon an unsuspecting world. In a protest over pencils, Clark organized a sit-in, where she made an inflammatory speech against the governor, and then burned a picture of the Pope. Then they set off a few stink bombs at the house of a mentally ill man whom no one respected or fully understood. She left the faculty in a storm of controversy. Whether she was fired or resigned remains to be discovered, but soon she was in New York, where her reputation as an activist and troublemaker endeared her instantly to the disaffected activists and various hangers-on and yawning bloodsuckers that characterized the cutthroat scenario and breakneck pace of the international art scene in that whirlwind year of 1952. After the exhibition, Anne and Flora retired to the Danish Patriotic for coffee and salad. Soon they were inseparable. Afterwards, they strolled. And so finally, in other words, their friendship continued to blossom. And when time seemed right, Anne introduced young Flora to the mysterious and forbidden world of fibers. Late into the night and deeper into the haunted summer, they spun. They usually began their evenings at the Toucan Club, where Anne held court for her quivering admirers. And they japed one another over the vibrating pulse of the thickening rhythm of New York jazz. This extremely rare footage of Flora and Anne can be seen when they were accidentally caught on kinescope at a Labor Day bash. Many gossiped about their relationship. It seemed unusually close. When Flora met this fixin', Anne Clark, she was very, very vulnerable. I would consider Anne a cross between Sappho and Giorgio Keith. Uh, both of them did fibers, probably, but I don't think, and I don't think they ever did them together. Oh, no wonder that Flora's own work began to imitate that of her new mentor. Suddenly, through the mysterious medium of fiber, her paintings and collages began to come alive. Still, there comes a time in all apprenticeships that the skills of the apprentice must overpower those of her mentor. However, not in this case. Instead, Anne began to lose interest and became resentful of Flora's growing dependence. That fall, Anne's visibility increased amongst those with a careful eye tuned to the sound waves of political protest. She became involved in a mission to send sailor hats to the disadvantaged children of Sweden. At the center of this charitable enterprise was the performance artist, Wilma Lee Farquhar. As Clark became more distant, Flora began once again to show signs of collapse. Then, when the grave undertaking was forced underground, Anne severed her ties with Flora forever. In 72, Anne Clark remembered... Well, Flora, it was really kind of a close friend of mine, but, you know, I didn't know her that well. Uh, uh, we, uh, we uh, had some fiber times together, and, uh, most people think that we didn't engage in fibers, but hell, I, I did fibers with half the women in New York. Uh, her brother denies this fact, and most art historians do, but most of them haven't even heard of her. Flora returned to her tiny room, depressed, suicidal, and once again unable to work. Her friends tried to comfort her, but all hope seemed lost. Then, finally, Flora chanced upon this man, Coleman McManahan, the illustrator and muralist whose finely defined images of Depression-era America were chiseled into the walls of Chicago's Benjamin Taylor Antitrust Building and emblazoned on the anteroom ceiling of the Norman Building in Colchester County, Iowa. Recognizing a fellow Philadelphian, the gentle McManahan took her under his wing and guided her like a mother hen through the difficult to fully describe corridors of her shattered world. To cheer her spirits, he decided to take her on a cruise to Cuba. It was 1954, and the decadence of the Batista regime was at its most opulent. Flora danced in the halls of the rich and feasted on the spoils of a country gone mad, while at the doors of revolution a populist hungered for a drink of revenge. And it was into this burning saga that the unsuccessful and confused Rene Casagimas was now thrust. Casagimas was a recent engineering school dropout who had become a derelict and occasional jazz singer. He had rebelled against his bourgeois parents and run away to work on a monkey ranch when he discovered an interest in music. And soon moved to San Juan to exploit it. Casagimas was said to have had a passable voice, but it was an almost pathological inability to remember song lyrics that poisoned his career as a vocalist. Havana.
spending all their time together. Although McManahan did not support the relationship, he agreed to bring Renee to New York when they returned. It was a stormy journey, but they soon arrived in the most famous city in the world. There, Flora gloried in showing Renee the exciting landmarks, Macy's, the Empire State, Fifth Avenue, and Broadway. They eked by for several months in a cold water flight in Soho. They toured the bars, and Renee got occasional singing jobs, and Flora returned to her painting, producing a number of intriguing works, which were to be a precursor toward a greatness to come. At last, she began to get noticed. Her work was seen and admired by a number of local artists who were making the scene during the aggressively restless years of 1956. Flora met Frank Stella at the Toucan Club, where Renee was performing as a replacement act for the usual singer who was strung out on dope. When I met her for the first time over at the Toucan Club, and, uh, she had brought with her a portfolio and spread it out all over the bar. And at first I was thinking, well, I don't know, you know, just, I don't, you know, I didn't, she was an unknown. People bring their stuff to me all the time. And she just spread it out in front of the bar in front of me, and it was it was impressive. I, I you know, for an unknown. Then, in the blistering intrigue that resulted from the communist uprisings in Cuba, Rene was deported to Siam. Yes, yes, Rene. He, uh, I met him once. Uh, me and my wife went up there um, to see my sister. Uh, caught one of his shows didn't have any talent. Flora was crushed by Renee's absence, but she fought back. Although weakened and badly shaken, she chose this time to sink or swim, and she threw herself into her work with an absurdness that was to become her greatest period of activity. So many times she had allowed the weight of her tragic past to plunge her into a torture chamber of despair. Somehow she knew now it was only the work that mattered. Somehow, she rose above the depths of need and dependence to become for the first time truly her own woman, not the precious daughter, not the teenage bride, not the impressionable student, not the plaything of an unemployed activist, or even the grieving companion of a harmless idiot. She was now, for the first time, standing alone, unfettered and without bonds. She disappeared into her studio for weeks, emerging only to show her work to anyone who would look at it, and to, of course, tend to those things which a person can't get along without, such as shopping, getting her mail, resting, having her meals, and sleeping. She virtually stopped drinking and smoking. She quit swearing and stopped chewing gum. She somehow finally licked that nail-biting problem and stopped spitting and stopped that annoying habit of answering everything anyone asked her by repeating the question. Yes, it was ironic. Irony, even now, it seems a strange word, especially when used to describe an uncomfortable and yet somehow humorous twist, as it might be used to apply to a situation that results in poetic justice. 59. The summer of 59. There were these rumors going round like wildfire about this broad. Peggy Guggenheim invited me over to her flat, Flora's flat, for a look-see. To my disappointment, there was no meat. None. Whatsoever. They had pickles, cornbread, raisin bran, French toast, chocolate, but they didn't have any meat. Flora. I think I think we all remember Flora. She was very passionate in her work, and I, I think up until the point when, well, actually, Motherwell stole her ideas. She was very passionate with, with almost everyone, and we had such a good time with her. She was... Clement Greenbaum, Berg, born, the man with the $40 million closet, told me to my face. Does this look phallic to you? He told me that I stole her imagery. Let me tell you folks, this is not the case at all because when I got to the party, there was no meat and I left. And that's the end of that. Well, I gotta tell you, there was nothing for me. Yes, Flora seemingly exploded with passion. Her work was everywhere except where it should have been. She argued with everyone, even Leo Costelli, the only gallery owner who seemed willing to be interviewed about her. Don't call me at work. Uh, it was 1958, I think, when I first met Fauna. And I thought we were going to work well together. She really was a very argumentative type. Uh, she was very passionate about her work, but 
I think that she wasn't really on the, the same plateau as a lot of other artists working at the time, even though perhaps she was unhappy or, let's say, passionate about her work. Whether or not her work had the meat of a formal exhibit, we just had to, her heart was too hard. I can remember how it all happened. Rauschenberg, myself, Flora, decided to break into the show scene. We had the work, the drive, we were ready and we knew it. But Flora wouldn't hang on just any white wall. No, it had to be the tops with her, it had to be the mat or nothing at all. We also knew that Flora didn't have the reputation to carry a major group show. So somebody mentioned this like group show and so we went to the club and then we went outside and we went up these stairs and so then after we got upstairs we saw all these like colored lights and there were these little tweeting noises and then uh, I looked in the mirror and I saw my face and it it looked like a big skull and all the all the skin had come off and then I saw this like uh, hairy goat and I started thinking about where this dog that my friend Tim used to have he was a uh, German Shepherd and he had a little scratchy tail. <laughs> First shrink I had died of cancer and then the second shrink I had had brain cancer so I would highly recommend getting a medical report before you see any shrinks to ensure some kind of mental stability so that you're not left hanging in the cold as usual. Okay. Um, other than that, my life is pretty much in turmoil, and it still is in turmoil. My car doesn't work. My record player doesn't work. My life doesn't work. She was digging around in this dumpster, and she brings this sink over to my studio. And she says to me, I really want to do something with this sink. I really want to pay homage to Duchamp. It upset me. And I says, Flora, wait a minute. What are you doing? You gotta, excuse me a second, just a second here. Uh, oh, that's better, thank you. Flora, she just, she had this big fixation with Duchamp, and I never understood why. Um, her work is so much different than, than Duchamp. It's, it's kind of phallic in its own way, but um, it's not as phallic as Duchamp in that she didn't use a urinal. She, she just never stopped working. Every day, every night, always working. She, she was very, very tired one day, and she came over to my studio again, and, and she was just so tired. And I said, Flora, dear, it's not worth it. Take some time. Enjoy life. Have a drink. Have a drink of water. Ah, that's good. Very passionate. Uh, her work, so-so. Uh, although I thought it was kind of like Pollux in the respect that it had the passion. She would be considered, in my opinion, a genius. There really seemed to be no way of stopping her. Still, it was strangely significant that the time she spent in her studio was time robbed of her, robbed never to be recovered and never to be remembered. She began to deteriorate suddenly. After two years of incredible creativity, she suddenly seemed to shut down. She saw she had been abandoned by her friends, and her family remained estranged. She returned to drink and began to seek out lower companions. She began to swear again and chew gum. Soon she began biting her nails and resumed her annoying habit of answering any question you ask her by repeating the question. She occasionally picked up a brush, but found she couldn't remember which color she liked anymore. She made plans for a trip to Burma, but never followed through. Twenty-five of her paintings were destroyed in a fire she herself started. Other paintings were abandoned in bars or forgotten on public buses. No one could get really excited enough to explain her ambivalent behavior. Her conditions worsened. She barely supported herself and seldom could be coaxed to even comment on her former talent. A year passed, and Flora seemed to sink further into her private world, even considering the idea of returning to Pennsylvania. On the day after Christmas, 1961, Flora awoke from a dream, a dream which she acclaimed had given her a new direction toward what she claimed would be the next step on the ladder of her artistic evolution. She seemed to gain strength, and then, after, on New Year's Eve, she uncustomarily phoned her twin brother, Fritz, inviting herself to his annual New Year's dance. <sighs> yes, I received the phone call, New Year's Eve, me and my wife 
having our annual New Year's Eve party. And Flora said, well, I want to come down. I got some good news. I got some good ideas. And I said, well, yeah, come on down, you know. So I told her to come down. It, I should have known better. The weather report wasn't good. But I wanted to see her. I knew she's in bad shape. She smoked, smoking way too much, drinking way too much. Also, her mental state. I told her to come. Her death is probably my fault. My fault. The next morning, her car was found overturned in a canal, breaking the crust of the ice and trapping her in the freezing and unsanitary canal water. Flora Van Doren. At 29, the victim of a seemingly irrational act of nature, and perhaps a victim of the equally irrational world of modern art.